Pamela, take congratulations on your documentary with Peter Bradley. Thank you so much, Gig. Thanks for having me on your show. Hey, not a problem, not a problem. Hey, so let, let me let me congratulate you even more that this film is being showcased at Slam Dance Film Festival, one of the most prestigious film festivals in the world. Uh, how do you feel about that? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm honored. I'm excited. Um, I, I What I love about Slam Dance, other than the fact that it's, you know, one of the first festivals of the year, so I, it's that chance to get out the gate. Um, I love that it's really filmmaker centric and it's not too big, you know, it, it all happens in one place and, um, I'll just get to see some great movies. That's what I'm looking forward to is going to see some great movies and meeting other filmmakers and, um, just the, the whole vibe of it, uh, I think is perfect for this film, um, which was a very DIY undertaking on my part. You know, it was just what they call a passion project um, where I just made it myself in my spare time, uh, which sadly I had a lot of spare time, especially since COVID hit um, where I wasn't working on other jobs. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be really fun. Well, let, let's ask that first question that every, everybody always ask about these type of films is uh, what sparked you to do a film on Peter Bradley? Well, initially, so let me back up. So Peter and I live like a six minute drive from one another in this small town, Saugerties, New York. We're a hundred miles north of New York City along the Hudson River. And um, I heard about Peter through a local art gallerist, Robert Langdon, who had shown some of Peter's paintings in his tiny little storefront art gallery in the summer of 2019, and had learned uh, had learned about some remarkable aspects of, of Peter's biography, um, where he had he had risen to some amazing heights at a fairly young age, and then seemed to kind of fall off the radar. And then had been hanging out, you know, right down the road from me for for decades, just kind of quietly painting and doing his thing without anyone really paying much attention. And so, you know, visually, I sensed a great story because abstract painting just is, you know, I could really sink the camera lens into that. And particularly how Peter throws paint, you know, it's very cinematic. Um but then once I started filming Peter and realizing the depth of his story of his life, I realized it was an important, you know, it was it was a more important story than I realized. Um, not in an earth shattering way, but in a very, very uniquely American way. Um, and as this kind of historic figure in 20, mid 20th century, kind of culture and, and art, you know, he, he really attained some amazing uh, success uh, before, before the success went away. Yeah. Well, just by watching the video, uh, watching your film, Peter seems to be a very sociable guy. I mean, um, what, was he, was he pretty easy to convince to do this film? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the origin story is that my wife was the first one to meet him at, at that art exhibit in 2019. Robert introduced my wife as a filmmaker to Peter and Peter said, oh, you should make a movie about me. And so she said, she said, well, my husband would really be the one to do that. He does documentaries. And she told me and I totally forgot. And then our daughter was helping at the gallery over her Christmas break from college. And she came home one day and had talked to Robert about Peter and was like, he sounds amazing. It's like, okay, I got to get an introduction. But from the, Robert introduced me. I went over there to the house one day and Peter was like, great. You want to get your camera right now? Let's go, you know? And so he's been, he was eager to do it and completely open and a pleasure, really a prince, <laughs> you know, the whole time with me um, was, his attitude was always great, always happy when I would come around, um, would, would, would call me to be like, when are you coming back? You know, if I if I didn't see him for a week or more, 
just to check in on me. Really sweet. Um, of course, the Peter Bradley I met at the age of 79, and he's now 82, had was had mellowed out, I'm sure, a lot. Had softened the edges. Um, you know, you clearly get the sense that like a lot of artists, male artists, and particularly of his generation, you know, there's a lot of ego there. And, um, uh, but he he was really warm and very open with me. There was nothing he wouldn't talk about with me or try to answer. Sometimes he didn't have much to say about some stuff. Um, and, and interestingly enough, when I would try and gauge him on, Kind of heavier matters relating to race maybe it's because i'm a white guy and he wanted to pull some punches but i don't really think so i think he just really he he just doesn't dwell on that all that much you know peter talks about how he's just never been concerned with political art or distinctions between white and black art and he's always operated his social life has always straddled kind of like the white and black worlds i, I don't know how you would put it but you know he he he's just you know a, a a citizen of of the world uh and and is happy in any company you know as long as people are treating him respectfully so yeah the getting to know peter and that that intimacy of the time spent with him i think over 40 there were 40 different days that i went and filmed with peter over the mainly over the course of 6 months but then in little drips and drabs and um uh, yeah, I just really cherish that time and getting to be friends with him. And I guess if the worst I'm accused of is making a like a fluff piece <laughs> about Peter Bradley, uh, um, I can live with that because that's the Peter I met. That's the Peter, you know, I choose to see. <laughs> wow. For, 40 days of uh, fil filming Peter here. I mean, so, so did, did you like go on days like thinking like, okay, I'm just going to watch uh, Peter do his work or sometimes you'd be sitting there going, okay, we're going to just sit down and do interviews or did he just mix it up every single day? I, I would try and mix it up. Um, I mean, because we were so close, the great thing about it is that I could just go for a couple of hours, you know, I'd call him in the morning. Are you painting today? Yeah. You know, because weather was always because he was painting outside sometime in the winter, particularly it was really cold and it would be too cold to go outside. Um, so I'd film him painting and the nature of the way he works, he'll throw some paint down, but then it's got to sit and, and dry sometimes for days before he goes back to that canvas. So he'd work on it a little and then it'd be like, well, you want to go in the house? We can sit and talk. And so I would set up. I think there were something like 20 different interview setups where I was always trying to find a different look in that house. It got to be like, oh, you know, how can I do something that's not the same? You know, I would go into different rooms, you know, looking for a different background. Um, so it was very just kind of casual and organic. And I would, there were certain things I had in mind to ask him each time I'd sit him down. I'd want to talk about this, this sort of chapter in his life or another. Um, and then even after sort of the principal photography in in the in, in the first six months, um, I would edit and then make lists of things you know that I needed. And it was so easy just to grab the camera, drive over, have him answer a few questions, and come back, plug him in, you know. So it really was. It never felt like an effort, you know, making this. Certainly it took a lot of time and mental energy in in the editing of it but the, the the filming the production of it was just a blast you know i was just so happy and you know yeah if he was painting i would just set up and you know i'd be like wait you know I, you know he would he would stop and start for me if i if, you know because he would work so fast you know i'd be like wait i want to get over here i need to move the camera so i can see you throwing the paint and he'd be like sure you know and then things would happen and I would just ask him questions on the fly. I would always stick a mic on him. So, you know, half of the time he's talking, it's sort of in the process of working, you know, and the other half are more of these kind of formal interviews, which are very lo-fi. Um, I did use a light, but they, they seem, you know, very much natural light kind of feel around the house. 
Wow. He has so many, so many stories. I mean, were were there any stories of his that you regretted that you couldn't include into the film? Because obviously, uh, you know, length of length of the film does matter in something like this. Yeah, definitely. One of the ones that I regretted cutting out, but I did so because it was just kind of this outlier um, sidebar. Um was the story of Peter and Bishop Tutu in South Africa. <laughs> so, yeah, so Desmond Tutu. So Peter got this weird gig in the mid in the mid 80s where he got asked to go by some weird U.S. government organization, which one of his old friends thinks could have been some front for the CIA. But during apartheid, went as a black American artist to South Africa to to teach art and and to make art. Um, and he went over there and he was like, I never saw any students, but there was, I had access to all this welding equipment at a university in Johannesburg. And he made steel sculpture, which is not something I really feature in the film, but but it's very cool. He makes cool constructs out of scrap metal and stuff. Um, and he made this big sculpture. And one of the things I found at Peter's house, you know, is this little photocopy of a South African newspaper in 1985, a Bishop Tutu dedicating the Peter Bradley sculpture, like in some office plaza in Johannesburg. And it's like, what? You know? And so just things like that uh, were remarkable. He really, he really is sort of this zealot like figure in in later 20th century culture and and music and art you know all these intersections with the celebrities at the art gallery where he worked and famous artists um yeah peter peter clearly has that kind of personality where people just always wanted to be around him mm -hmm. and like i did and he's smart and eloquent and just charismatic and and so he became a magnet, you know, for all kinds of all kinds of people. I know it, it, it is a fascinating life. And speak of music, because one, one of the things that is always tough for any type of films is getting the music right. Uh, I, and and you managed to uh, pull some of that off into your film. Was that a difficult process for you? Well, <laughs> So Peter, for people that haven't seen the film yet, Peter, when he paints, always listens to music. So there was no way I was going to film him where there wasn't music playing in the background, often at a loud volume and 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 most often classic mid-century jazz, which he's had a passion for since childhood. Um, in those occasions where he's painting and you're hearing the music, I am clinging to a fair use determination that my production lawyer has given me um, where I'm not telling him what to put on. That's what he does. That's the reality. That's that's OK, she thinks. <laughs> yeah. um, we'll see. Friends of mine that have worked in the music business are like, yeah, well, up to a certain point, but then maybe not. But we'll see. But then, you know, most of the music you hear is an original jazz score composed by Javon Jackson which is amazing. It's just, he hit it out of the park. And it was recorded live in a studio by Javon and his quintet, bass, sax, uh, trumpet, uh, uh, drums, and piano. Um, and a nice tie-in with Javon is that Peter has known Javon since uh, the, the late 1980s, when mm -hmm. Javon... Uh, played with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, which is, you know, a top tier uh, jazz ensemble. It was the the, the end of Art Blakey's uh, career. He was quite old, but Peter would always go to support Art. He had known Art since he was a little boy. And, um, you know, Javon knew him since he was a young man right out of music school. And so uh, it was Peter's wife, Deborah, that invited me first to see a concert Javon gave down in Poughkeepsie, a summer jazz festival um, a year and a half ago. And then afterwards she said, I've got this idea. <laughs> I think Javon should do the music. And it was a perfect fit. And Javon loved the film. 
j talks about how he learned so much about Peter, even though he's known him so long, has never been around him while he's painting or heard him talk about art. So um, he totally got those reference points of, of the jazz greats and internalized that and then wrote his own compositions that are really another character in the film. Absolutely. I'd love to do a soundtrack album if we could get a little money where they could go back in and record some longer versions of the tracks. It's it's great, great music. That's that that sounds wonderful. Um when when you took your journey into a Peter's house, um was it was it like a eclectic uh like a art huge art studio with just art upon art lying around all over the place and uh and what's what's the difference between working at the house and at that uh, reefer storage in the middle of the woods for him? Yeah, well, right. Well, yeah, so Peter's got this property. I don't know. There's maybe like five acres or something. And it's an old uh, 18th century stone house that he gutted out. And it's very funky how he renovated it. It's very much an artist's house. But there's not so much art in there. He does have pieces by a number of other folks um that he likes um but not not nearly so much actually what i came to learn is that peter had a lot of artwork by very well-known artists that over the years when the things were lean he wound up having to sell off you know to pay mm -hmm. the bills which is kind of sad but then thank god he had it you know that there was value he probably bartered you know paintings with contemporaries contemporaries of his that had arguably more success than he did one the one that he's held on to is is an alexander calder um uh little painting i don't think it's a print i think it's an original um but uh you know a nice little book collection art books and then a lot of his canvases um either stretched or just lying around that he would put up while he's looking at um and then yeah that the shipping container um, the, his studio is a shipping container uh, where there really wasn't much room for anything except the paint and his big stereo system and records and random tools and stuff. Actually, what, some of the, one of the scenes that I cut out is pretty funny where he's just going through all this crap <laughs> that's piled up in the, in the studio where he's trying to just clean up and make space and he's holding up these random things that he saves that he, you know, that he cherishes like a, a hinge, like this, you know, 19th century big brass door hinge that he just loves as an object, you know, it's, it's just kind of cool. Um, so those little those little moments kind of had to fall by the wayside. You know, if I was doing something episodic, <laughs> there would have been a, a lot more of those little beats. Um, but uh, yeah, not 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 as much art as you would have thought, but a lot of plants and flowers. Mm -hmm. One one room in the house is, he calls it his greenhouse. And Peter is very passionate about, and has been since he was a child, about, about gardening and growing flowers. And so, and that really becomes because I started filming him in the winter through the summer, that growth of things coming to life and in bloom is, is a trajectory that that one of the only <laughs> arcs I had to work with um, other than his biography of chrono the chronology of his life as a story arc. So that really figures in. Well, most excellent. And, uh, and and how how did you know when to uh, finish your project with him? I, I I felt I felt like you could have easily uh, gone on another ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do a sequel, you know. Um, I it's a good question, uh, be, be, you know, because I've worked in documentaries for for many years. I at a certain point had a sense that. I needed to stop. Um, I had talked to him and talked to him. Um, this was in June, like mid June of 2020, when, in fact, you know, the last shot of him at about the point I said, I have enough, I want to take a break and edit for a while, is the last shot in the film where Peter's 
tending his rose bushes in the backyard and it's very lush and colorful and he looks up at me and he's like hey, let's go sit down and have a beer and i knew the second he said that i was like i don't know how i'm going to get there but that's going to be the last shot of the film because he's often just sitting and drinking drinking beer or, or wine as we're you know as he's painting or we're doing the interviews there's always beer cans around and um I just felt like I didn't want to overdo it, you know, mm. um, or if I needed more, I didn't know what else I needed yet. Um, and so that's when I stopped and edited in earnest for a couple of months. And then in the fall, sort of made a list of questions, you know, to fill in the blanks. Where were the, the gray areas? Because once I decided it was only going to be Peter, then I knew I had to rely. He He had to be the narrator of his story, you know, from start to finish. So it all had to be him explaining it. So, and that was something I went back a number of times over another six months, making my lists as I honed it down and structured things and would show the film to my very smart, generous friends who are filmmakers and editors that would watch it. And everybody always loved it, but they would say, well, you know, think about this. What if you ask him to talk about that. I didn't get this. And so they, you know, my my village, as you say, the, the village of filmmakers, and really that's what's great about documentary filmmaking is the, the sense of community and support mm -hmm. that everyone will give um, is really just great. And uh, I owe a lot to, to those friends. They're thanked in the credits, you know. Um, I would have loved to have been able to hire an editor, but, you know, I couldn't afford to do that. And, and just finding my way with it, just felt right to me anyway just it was as they say the dna of this film was just it was just going to be me and peter and so i really just that was the organizing principle really that i just tried to stay through and so picking the name of the film with peter bradley i just felt like well this is anybody watching it they're just there with me and peter you know um it, it's completely the experience I had. So, <laughs> well, it 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 is it is good hanging out uh, hanging out with uh, some someone who uh, achieved so much for four months. So, who who or what is next up for you? Who who are you going to hang out with? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I've been talking to um, a photographer, a remarkable photographer, whose work I've just recently discovered she um the trouble there is that she lives in england <laughs> so if i work with her it's going to take some money i can't just throw the gear in the car to work with her um but i i think i i like the idea of doing a piece with a photographer uh i'm not sure you know um we'll see what comes up hopefully now instead of just being thought of as a cinematographer and sometimes editor people will look at me as a filmmaker and I'll have other opportunities to to do some films if not just like this then then this is a jumping off point but I really do love filming artists and I'd be happy to work the same way again with the exception of the editing <laughs> I want to I want to have a great editor that I can work with because really filmmaking at its best is collaborative I think mm -hmm. and um and 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 very much so when it when it comes to the structuring of it, I, I think it takes more than a singular set of eyes on it. You know, um, most excellent. And um, let let us leave with one last thought, Alex. Uh, as uh, audiences have a chance to watch your film with Peter Bradley uh, at Slam Dance and hopefully at you know more down the road, what is what is the most important take that you hope that they would have? Uh, learn about the from this film that's a great question i need to have a good prepared answer for it i to me the takeaway is is really a personal one and the viewer hopefully to be inspired by peter as an example to number one to stick to your guns with what you think is right you know um and the the importance of daily practice you know to get to to really master anything it just takes work and that never stops no matter how old you are um and really the importance 
the underlying theme is the the importance the human the humanness of creative expression you know that that all of us should find something to do if it's not throwing paint on a canvas you know something where we're we're getting out of ourselves and and finding a way to express ourselves creatively um even if it, not to sell but for any reason um that joy is a great thing and it's too bad that as kids we get that sort of knocked out of us um at young ages at some time but uh yeah i guess those are the things i hope people take from it well alex Thank you very much uh, for carrying this conversation with us. Uh, with Peter Bradley is a wonderful film, and people will enjoy that at Slam Dance, and you should enjoy Slam Dance too. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Gig. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it.